here. As you know, the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, our fall speaker series, seeks to bring in the best uh, speakers on a variety of topics from our built environment to our lived environment to, um, to literature and history. And we're so glad to have all of you here because we know you are people who really care about our world and our place in it and love to be challenged uh, to, to think in new ways and to learn new things. Um, so we're so pleased to have you here. If you're a member, we're glad you're a member. And if you're not a member and you're visiting us tonight, we hope that you'll consider becoming a member of the Athenaeum, joining our family. If you're interested, just contact me or Tess afterwards and we will help you to do that. I'll remind you that anytime during our program, if you have a question that comes to your head and you don't want to wait till the Q&A time to type it in, you can put it in the Q&A and chat, either one of those icons. I will be keeping track of those. And during our Q&A time, um, I will moderate your questions with our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Kaufman. Now let me introduce you to our, our speaker. Dr. Gerald McAdams Kaufman is director of the University of Delaware Water Resources Center in Newark, Delaware, which is one of the 54 National Institutes for Water Resources supported by the US Geological Survey at land grant universities in the 50 states, the District of Columbia and three island territories. He holds faculty appointments in three schools, the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration, the College of Engineering and the Geography Department. And he has studied at two of the oldest colonial land grant institutions in the nation. Delaware established in 1743 and Rutgers established in 1766. If you get the trend here, I think you see that Dr. Kaufman is establishing his pedigree as a real Philadelphian and, uh, uh, and mid-Atlantic Northeasterner. So we're so glad to have you here tonight. Um, besides a lot of writing and work that he has done um, about watershed management, he serves as Delaware's first water master. I like that, I'm a water master. Uh, first water master appointed by the Governor and General Assembly by the Water Supply Coordinating Council Act of 2000. Now, most important, Jerry learned to play ice hockey in high school and college on the frozen ponds along the Delaware River, and now likes to play soccer in several leagues in Chester County, PA. And we are so honored to have you here tonight to share with us about the Brandywine Shad 2020, a project I learned about reading about in the New York Times, which led me to contact you. So thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. Uh, I invite you all to virtually join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Kaufman to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. All right. Uh, wow. Thanks, Beth. Uh, and thank you, Tess, uh, for the invitation. Uh, uh, I was mentioning that, that uh, you know, I learned about the building. I learned about your building in college when I was up at Rutgers uh, a few decades ago, uh, more than a few decades. Uh, but I was always uh, intrigued by the Athenaeum uh, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to going there someday uh, to, to see the architecture. But you guys have a good, re great reputation. I remember reading about you guys during the 80s, and um, you know I just love libraries as well. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia, so I am a native Pennsylvanian. Uh, so I could talk about Pennsylvania, and I could talk about Delaware. Uh, Delaware is the first state. Yesterday, December 7th, is Delaware Day, we call it, that where we signed the Constitution way back when, and Pennsylvania set, uh, signed it next, and then New Jersey. So Delaware will always be the, the, the first state. Although Delaware and Pennsylvania were both the same state. Delaware is part of Pennsylvania until 1776. So uh, our, our two states are, one's a state, one's a commonwealth. We're interconnected, uh, two states jo joined by a common water body, which is the Brandywine River. And that's what we're gonna talk about here tonight. So if you hear me say water, uh, you know where I'm from. Uh, I was born in Port Richmond up there. Uh, my aunt was a nun. Uh, a sister of St. Joseph. She uh, used to bring me books to read when I was five, five years old. And um, when I would go to go there to visit and um, she used to take me to libraries at like six and seven years old. So uh, I, I really, uh, I'm really delighted to be invited here tonight to talk about a fish and the Brandywine. So uh, I'm here to talk about the Brandywine Chad 2020 initiative. It has been featured in the New York Times. It's been in NPR. And right now the BBC is working on a a feature on the, the work that's being done in Wilmington to bring America's, uh, uh, the nation's founding fish uh, back to one of America's uh, historic small watersheds. And uh, as you can imagine, and Delaware is a very exciting place to be right now. Uh, Delaware's most famous resident is gonna be the president of the United States. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot going on down in Little Delaware. Come, come on down and visit us someday uh, in Newark, Delaware. We're going to talk about diagemous fish. Those are the fish that, um, anadromous fish are the fish that live in the ocean for most of their adults' lives. And they come in, they swim up to the uh, freshwater streams of their birth, and then they spawn. Uh, so it's a very interesting dynamic between living in salt water and then coming to fresh water. And one of the biggest uh, uh, streams uh, that, that hosts the anadromous fish are, is the Delaware. Uh, and one of its largest tributaries uh, is the Brandywine Creek. So the Brandywine, or we like to call it river in Delaware. Uh, we, we need all the rivers we can get. Uh, it, it, uh, the Brandywine discharge is about 10% of the uh, fresh water to the Delaware estuary. So it's a, it's a significant part of the, uh, uh, the regime of the Delaware Bay. So like an Atlantic sturgeon is a, an anadromous fish. There are these big six to seven feet long, uh, uh, like they're like dinosaurs, they're prehistoric fish that lived in the Delaware River. They're coming back now. They were the source of caviar uh, back in around the turn of the 20th century. And they basically got overfished. They would take the, the, the fish eggs from the sturgeon here in the Atlantic and then ship them back over to Russia to the Black Sea and then can them and bottle them and sell them back here as, uh, as Russian caviar. Uh, striped bass are anadromous fish. They're a beautiful fish. They're good to eat. And then the American shad, which is basically the East Coast salmon. We're going to focus on that here today. The American shad is, is part of the culture of the Delaware, uh, Delaware Valley uh, in, in Gla Gloucester, New Jersey, right next to the town where I grew up in, in Pensacola, New Jersey, uh, William Penn's hunting ground. Uh, Gloucester used to host these uh, uh, plank shad dinners in, in the 1880s at the hotels over there. Uh, they were just like the blue blue claw crab fest that we have now. And then river herring. River herring are these small little shiny fish that come up as well, and they follow the American shad. So, you know, we like books. Uh, we, we just have a book that just released called The Delaware Naturalist Handbook. A bunch of us uh, co-authored, and a lot of the history I'm going to talk about here is published in this handbook. It's a way for, to teach people about conservation and uh, the conservation movement. And, um, you know, here's one of the chapters. This is my chapter on watershed ecology. Uh, but for uh, it, this is a good map to show us, orient us uh, where we are. So we're in the greater Delaware River watershed that originates in New York, up in the Catskills, flows down to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, so that's, a, that's about um, uh, the, the population there is about 15 million people that drink the water. So that's about 5% of the United States drink the water from this small little watershed here. And then within the Delaware Basin is the Brandywine watershed here, along with the white clay where the university is. And you can see the Brandywine sort of like a shape, like a pork chop, we'll call it. That's a, not, that's a scientific term. Uh, basically, it's wide up in Chester County, uh, Westchester, Downing Town, Coatesville. And then it funnels down and comes in the, and goes in the uh, Brandywine at Wilmington. And you can see the circular arc boundary there. Uh, that is the circular arc boundary that William Penn drew in 1682 to separate the, uh, the Quakers in Philadelphia from the Catholics, the Calverts in Baltimore. So he set a, a boundary that was uh, 12 miles in radius from Newcastle. And William Penn landed in Newcastle first, uh, didn't find a large enough river to be next to, so went up to, uh, uh, settled in the peninsula between, Phil uh, between the Delaware and the Schuylkill. And the history has been like that ever since. But this 12 mile boundary that separates now the Commonwealth from our, the first state uh, is very important because it bisected the watersheds, the streams like the Brandywine as they flowed down. So like the Duke of York, remember him? Uh, he didn't last too long uh, with Charles II. Uh, he recommended uh, uh, circumscribing this boundary 40 miles in radius. And then that, if that would have happened I always kid around with my friends up in Chester County. Uh, Chester County would have been part of Delaware and we would have had four counties. Uh, maybe we'll work on that to annex Chester County. But in any case, we have this situation where the water comes in. Uh, most of Delaware's water supply, three quarters of it originates up in Pennsylvania in a small sliver of Maryland. You can also see the, uh, uh, the Mason-Dixon line, that north-south boundary that separates Newark and Maryland. And then the more traditional east-west boundary that we, uh, we, call, we call that the line between north and south, uh, that was uh, surveyed by Mason and Dixon in the 1760s. 
And that also separates the, the, the waters from the, uh, uh, so that basically landlocked Delaware from the Chesapeake Bay. So those decisions that were made to survey the states way back when have, uh, uh, it's one of our main challenges, how do we manage the interstate flow of water across political boundaries? It's, it's one of our big challenges. And as a matter of fact, there was a, a category on Jeopardy uh, called Delaware. And uh, one, of the, one of the categories, what is, what is the nation's only circular state boundary? It's Delaware is the answer. Uh, so I, I knew most of the answers for that Jeopardy question. Any case, it did hit the New York Times, uh, Beth, the, the story back in, in February uh, about the, uh, the restoration of the, of the brandy wine after all these years. And there was actually a story in the New York Times yesterday about Wilmington. Um, um, some people here in Delaware liked it. A lot of people thought, well, uh, there's a lot more to Delaware than what's being written about in the New York Times. Come down and visit. Uh, there's going to be a lot going on down there. So um, uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, books, we love books. Uh, the Brandywine has a pretty good uh, uh, literature of, of the of the Brandywine itself. Uh, it, it's been compared in a book here by uh, H. Barksdale Maynard, a Princeton grad, uh, that he calls it the Thames of, uh, of, of America. And so the Brandywine has quite a history, a beautiful history. Uh, the Wyatts, it's, the, uh, it's the, uh, the Valley of the Wyatts up in Chad's Ford. Uh, so we have a, a very good history that's been written about in the literature that I'm gonna draw from here as I, as I continue the talk. So uh, this is the Brandywine here. Uh, it flows out of the Piedmont Plateau. Uh, it's, a, it's a geologic province. Piedmont is literally, uh, well, literally, um, uh, my English professors say, don't say literally. Uh, it's, uh, it's Italian for foot of the mountains. So we're, we are in the foot of the Appalachians 100 miles away, but you can see this rugged topography, that's a thousand feet above sea level, not too far north of Westchester. And you can see this uh, canyon of the Brandywine uh, with, the, with the topography. It, 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 is a, uh, it is a plateau. Uh, and the, and, the, and the Brandywine flows through this canyon. And uh, that has a lot to do with how the fish come down and uh, the history. So it's hit the local newspapers. Uh, this is Joe Biden's favorite newspaper. It's the Delaware News Journal. Uh, I get this delivered to my house. Uh, it's been featured in the partnership for the Delaware Estuaries uh, newsletter about the free flowing, uh, the restoration of the Brandywine and taking the dams down. Uh, there is my uh, colleagues, uh, Jim Shanahan and Hunter Lott. They're, they're the two Riverside residents that actually got this Brandywine Shad 2020 initiative started. Uh, about a couple of years ago, they gave me a call and said, hey, we, could you help us out? And they're, they're, really, they're one of the driving forces that it. So I'm speaking for, for Jim and Hunter here this evening about Brandywine Shad 2020. And the idea was to basically take all the dams down uh, that have been up for like 300 years. By the end of 2020, we have uh, we have about 22 days. <laughs> but uh, we've set these very ambitious uh, target and milestones. It actually resonates with uh, some of the supporting agencies. Uh, it's hit na a national NPR. It's been on there. They got 15,000 hits, uh, the most hits they ever got in a story. Uh, so I've been in the water business for a while, and and I'll tell you the fish. The fish story is is resonates with people. We we can talk about watersheds and rivers and you know ecology, but when you talk about fish, people just love it. Uh, just they just love the fish. They can tell you about where they fish. They won't tell you where they catch them, but they'll tell you all about how big they are and things like that. So uh, the history the history goes back to the Lenape. Uh, the, the, it wasn't the Europeans were the first people, of course. The First Nations were the Lenape. The Lenape. Uh, uh, the Lenny P people, and you can see the uh, there's this light color line here is the uh, this was this is the tribal areas associated with well we call it the Delaware but that's really not accurate because that's from Lord Delaware he was the first English governor of uh, Jamestown in Virginia uh, and we really ought to go back to the Lenny Lenape name Hacking which is the name of the uh, the Lenape and then to the west you can see the Susquehannock tribes so um, it, it's fascinating to talk about that the Lenape were here for three millennia. And uh, we have uh, uh, published literature that, that indicates that we're finding, uh, we're not finding, but the uh, archeologists are finding uh, arrowheads and artifacts 30 miles off the coast of Delaware and the, and the uh, coastal plain, 
uh, the coastal plain and on the outer, uh, the intercontinental shelf, it means that the Lenape were there uh, 3,000 years ago and they were living way out off the coast before the sea started rising, which is fascinating. So uh, uh, Delaware was bigger at one time, uh, but that was 3,000 3, years ago. And then the Europeans came, the Swedes settled here at the mouth of the Christina. Uh, they called it the Christina Kill in 1638. It's the uh, oldest European settlement in the entire Delaware Valley. And there's quite a Swedish heritage here in Wilmington that, 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 re, that emanates from that. Uh, we have the map 1687 AD. Why do we call it the Brandywine? Well, we think it's because of the Dutch influence. There's a big debate about that. Uh, one of the big debates is the Brandywine a river or is it a creek? We call it a river down here in Delaware because we need rivers. We don't have too many. And a river is basically, uh, I think in the nomenclature I like, it's, uh, it's a river that's large enough that you have to swim. It's a waterway, it's large enough that you have to swim across. And a creek is small enough that you can wade across. So I think that's a good distinction. Uh, Coin Amensing is, a, is an Indian uh, Lenape town just upstream near Chad's Ford, a beautiful town. The folklore is uh, that the, uh, the, the, uh, the Lenape called the Brandywine the river of the longfish. And they must have been talking about the Atlantic sturgeon that used to spawn and come up. Come up. So you can imagine those giant fish spawning there back in the day of the, uh, the colonists. And you can see here the maps of 1749, the three lower counties. You can see the Mason-Dixon line wasn't drawn yet. Uh, these political boundaries weren't there yet, but Delaware was closely associated half with uh, the Pennsylvania colony and half with Maryland. So we're, we're kind of uh, uh, in between. New Jersey, where I grew up, Ben Franklin called it a barrel tapped at both ends by Philadelphia and New York. Delaware has is a lot of what's going on in New Jersey almost to a smaller degree. Uh, the Conestoga wagon originated in the Brandywine watershed. Uh, Conestoga, there's a Conestoga high school up in the Great Valley, up near Valley Forge, 1751. And those wagons, of course, settled the West. Uh, the largest battle of the American Revolution occurred along the Brandywine. Uh, this was, uh, uh, Howard Pyle was uh, in the Wyeth school there, uh, painted this and uh, it was, it was one of the uh, biggest battles in the American Revolution. The Americans lost, uh, but eventually the British went to invade uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, but it was enough to uh, get the French on uh, the American side and originally the Americans won the war. Uh, we say if the Battle of Brandywine didn't happen the way it did, uh, and if uh, George Washington wasn't able to get out of there, uh, we might've been, uh, we might've been like Canada uh, and, and history would have been different. So. Uh, Delaware was at the crossroads of the revolution. Uh, we have the old Hessian diaries that show the, uh, the, uh, the path of the British from the head of Elk, head of Chesapeake, instead of sailing up to Delaware uh, to invade Philadelphia in 1777, they sailed up the Chesapeake and marched overland across the narrow uh, neck of, of Delaware. They came through Newark right by my office here, Academy Street, and then marched up to the Brandywine. And they had the Battle of Chad's Ford because that narrow Canyon was the first ford above Wilmington. And that's why they had the battle there. So the waterways uh, played a big part in American history, particularly during the American Revolution. Uh, here's the route from the Chesapeake up through Delaware when the British invaded it in 1777. Uh, you know, that was the first British invasion, not during uh, the second was during the 60s with the Beatles, okay? Uh, and then going up to, um, uh, I was barely old enough to remember the Beatles and then went up to uh, Pennsylvania. So there's a very historic place. Here's Cannon Square where, that, where the Hessians and the British uh, settled there for a couple nights. Uh, the DuPonts put the Brandywine on the map. Uh, they searched up and down the Eastern seaboard for a place to put their gunpowder mills because they wanted to use hydropower. Uh, so they were very advanced coming over from France and they settled in the Brandywine uh, and uh, became you know, one of the world's largest uh, companies, one of the largest chemical companies you can't go anywhere in Delaware without the DuPonts. Uh, most of our state parks, like the Brandywine State Park, were former DuPont estates. Uh, we have big buildings at our campus that were named after DuPonts, et cetera. Why did they settle here? Because the fall of the Brandywine from Chad's Ford down to sea level at Wilmington in just a few miles is, uh, is higher than Niagara Falls. So you have this hydropower that the DuPonts recognized. And it was really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So we have these mills that were built uh, this is a map from uh, 1816. 
a beautiful hand-drawn map that shows downtown Wilmington, um, uh, just, uh, just about where I-95 comes across it now. Uh, so they, they, uh, this was so uh, advantageous to have mills there. This was the first real power that you could produce in large quantities, hydropower, that they put dams every few hundred feet where they could put them, where the elevation said you could put another one, like stepping stones. And they, they didn't put just one raceway on one side, they put two raceways and they got double the power. And this was also so uh, strategic because right there in downtown Wilmington is sea level. So the ships and the scallops could sail up, they would mill the flour, et cetera, and, and the grains and, the, um, and, the, and the, um, uh, the fabrics, and then they could put them in the ships and they would sail up and down the Eastern seaboard over to Europe and Asia, et cetera. So uh, this uh, history is very fascinating here uh, with, uh, with the building the mill dams. And that's one of the things Wilmington is famous for is, is one of the beginnings of the industrial revolution. So we have a good, historic database of that. And if, if you live here, it's very fascinating to see uh, like Joseph Tatnell, uh, there's a Tatnell school here uh, that, that uh, where the, the, uh, the first industrialists were uh, big names here in Delaware society. And so the, the Brandywine and the Christine are also very uh, famous because Harriet Tubman, the Moses of the New World uh, would lead the slaves from the Eastern shore of Maryland and Delaware and Virginia North. And that when they crossed the slaves crossed the Christina right here and Brandywine, they were free. So south of the Christina and the Brandywine, it was a slave state of Delaware and north, it was free. And so uh, Harriet Tubman led the slaves across the Christina and they were free to the Quaker meeting houses uh, because this area of course was one of the centers of Quaker, um, of, of, of the Quakers who were uh, very tolerant abolitionists. 1864, Wilmington was a, was well, like a teeming uh, uh, sea town uh, here. Uh, that's also fascinating to see. And you can see all the forests were cut down uh, for fuel. And so the, the good thing is now with our watershed, we have more forests now than we ever did in 150 years, which is a good thing. Wilmington here again, here's the Brandywine itself. You can see the old dams. This is the, these are the dams we're talking about now, uh, removing in a historically uh, friendly manner. Downtown Wilmington was a, a big ship shipyard they used to call the uh, Delaware Valley the um, uh, the arsenal of America uh, and uh, even Frederick Long Olmsted has an influence here in the Brandywine uh, there's a park it's called Brandywine Park here uh, that was designed by Frederick Long Olmsted's firm after he designed uh, Central Park as an oasis for the uh, the masses and if you go to Brandywine Park get off I-95 just get off there and check it out. It's, it's really like a mini prospect park in Brooklyn uh, with the same architecture, separation of pedestrians and motorized traffic, the landscape architecture. It's just beautiful, really. We're, we're rediscovering that with this Brandywine Shad 2020. This is downtown Wilmington where the first dam is or was at, uh, right, at the, right, right before the end of the Roaring Twenties and right when the uh, stock market was, was uh, just about to collapse. And you can see the industry there. Uh, Hoops Reservoir, the, the Hoover Dam of Delaware, uh, uh, the Works Progress uh, Administration, uh, right before Roosevelt got in, put people back to work. Uh, there were jobs program building the tunnels. I like this because this, this to me shows true diversity, inclusion, you know, the camaraderie of people, the uh, decency of putting people back, getting people back to work is really good to see in these times. Um, and then this is the big cotton mills uh, by uh, uh, up Bancroft up in the, just upstream from Wilmington there, a big industrial complex. There's, we call this dam number number four at Bancroft Mills. And, uh, you know, so that's what we're working on. So uh, this is dam number two along the Brandywine. You could skate there. How do you know that climate change or atmospheric warming is happening? I think it is. I used to skate for, for two months in Pensacola. Uh, during the late 70s and early 80s when we uh, formed our hockey team, Bishop Eustace. Uh, second, Brandywine Valley Association, the second, the smallest, small watershed association, uh, the oldest in America, formed right after the Second World War to restore the Brandywine. Uh, so that's historic. Uh, we have the DuPonts buying all the land, the King Ranch up in the upper Brandywine uh, for a reservoir. This is during the 20s. 
and it became the largest cattle ranch east of the Mississippi and protected land. So uh, speeding up to 2013, uh, Barack Obama uh, used the Antiquities Act in 1906 and Theodore Roosevelt to uh, uh, sign an executive order to, uh, we, we, net, we had Delaware's first national park, which is very historic uh, in the upper Brandywine, right at the boundary between Pennsylvania and Delaware near that arc. And that's very historic because that put the Brandywine on the map. Now the Brandywine is getting national attention and Congress uh, eventually under, with Barack Obama signed the legislation to form the national park. So now we have the National Park Service involved in the, in the Brandywine just upstream of Wilmington. Uh, check, come down to Wilmington and then drive upstream uh, through Hagley Museum, go to Winter Tour, uh, so, uh, the Moors, some of the beautiful, most, pub, most beautiful public gardens in America are here in Wilmington. And there are students uh, doing research, helping us getting this Brandywine Shad 2020. So now we're talking about the fish. Um, this is the American Shad. Uh, Alosa uh, sapodisma, uh, which is the Latin for a savory fish. So it, it is a good tasting fish, but it um, uh, has a lot of bones. So there's a way of cooking it uh, that, that, uh, that you do. Um, you know, uh, you basically have to uh, drown it in butter and, and it, butter will make anything taste good. Uh, but basically the American shad can get up to about two and a half feet long. And uh, the other type of shad is called the hickory shad, uh, Losa mediocris. That's, a, that's not a good name to give a fish to be mediocre, but it is. Uh, so that's what it is. And how can you tell the difference? Uh, the hickory shad has a protruding uh, lower jaw, sort of like the Jay Leno of, of shad, we call it. Okay. And uh, so if you want to do a little ichthyology and distinguish between the two, just look for the jaw protruding, and that's the hickory shad. Okay. So, uh, uh, it's a very beautiful fish. I took a kayak expedition in the upper Delaware up to Water Gap uh, about six years ago. And came, we were coming down and uh, saw these uh, big aquamarine uh, floating objects swimming in circles. And I thought they were like toy boats, you know, that were kids were uh, using, playing with. And they were American shad that had spawned, uh, swam all the way up 200 and some miles uh, in the uh, headwaters there near the Catskills. And they had laid their eggs and they were just basically swimming in circles uh, to eventually die. And then they leave their nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus that help to restore the river. So there's this eternal uh, ecological cycle that's involved in this. And uh, the, you know, the Delaware River used to have zero oxygen during the 60s and 70s. It was a dead river and it's been restored after the Clean Water Act and the Delaware River Base Commission. That's one of the reasons why the fish can now swim up past the oxygen block. Uh, how do I know? I used to play down by the Delaware River in the late 70s and 80s, and it was an oily mess. The fish that we caught there had oil all over them. So when I go back there, I love to see the recovery of it. So, you know, this is a big American shad in the Delaware River. They get pretty big. Uh, they're big like they call them a poor man's tarpon, poor person's tarpon. Uh, they're very big sporting fish. Uh, the shad were big abundance. Uh, they started to level off, but they are making a comeback. Uh, from the various fishery surveys. So now I'm getting into science. But one of the issues here is we have this striped bass, which we love. They're an Asmus fish. The striped bass eat the young American shad. And so there's kind of this crossing uh, 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 fish abundance here where the shad, unfortunately, the striped are eating the young shad, we think. And that's one of the reasons why the shad populations are going down a little bit. So these are the dams. Uh, there, there, uh, there are 10 dams on the lower Brandywine between Wilmington and Chad's Ford. And you can see the elevation profile there, why the DuPonts put all the dams there and the industrialists like Bancroft for the cotton mill because of this fall from uh, you know, 100, some 150 feet above sea level down. It's, it's, it actually, uh, scientifically, it is called a falls or a cascades uh, in, in, the, in the lower Brandywine area. Uh, so this is the, the first dam here. And uh, we helped the city of Wilmington uh, uh, take it out. Uh, so this is the, uh, the actual physical removal of it. We hire a contractor. It looks really bad uh, what they're doing in the river there with the construction equipment. This is what dam restoration is, dam removal. Uh, you have all this equipment in there, but don't worry, Mother Nature will restore it very quickly with the, uh, with the next storm, a few next storms. This is dam number three, 
the Augustine Mill Dam. This has been breached by Mother Nature. We're working on a project to uh, clean some of this up to make it more restored. Uh, where are the shad? Uh, well, they're here. Uh, these are the fishery surveys that have been done uh, by the uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, the shad are in the lower Christina and lower Brandywine. They're just waiting to swim up as the dams are, are removing. So um, uh, let's see, I didn't, um, yeah, I just have redundancy here. So we have a group now, the, this is us, a part of the group working with the, uh, the city of Wilmington to go out and, and do the fishery surveys. Uh, this was uh, this, um, before the pandemic hit. And uh, you know that we have a, a fish abundance survey now that goes out and, uh, and nets the fish. So the last netting was done in the fall. So after the dam was removed, will the, will the shad swim up? That's one of the great mysteries well they have. And they, they have, in one season, they swim up the juvenile shad. And that's a big finding, over 150. For the first time, we think, in centuries, since the first dam was built by a Swedish surgeon in 1685. So, um, you know, that's almost three and a half centuries for the first time this fish is swimming up. And one of the best parts of this project, we think, is we're getting the kids involved. So these are the kids uh, that go to elementary schools, junior highs, some of them are in high school, Wilmington. Uh, they live like a few blocks from the Wilmington, uh, Brandywine, but they, they really don't get a chance to come down the river. Now they come down and help us with the fish surveys, netting. Uh, one day, hopefully, it'll be scientists going to school, going to college, maybe having careers. And this is a, this is a great thing. This, this fish project's not just about the fish. It's about the history of the Brandywine, uh, revitalizing the city. Uh, all, this, all these fish are being caught right underneath I-95, uh, right in the center of the megalopolis uh, in the shad capital of Delaware. Right? So here's, here's Muskie Mike, one of our friends. He's, he's catching fish now. So this spring during the pandemic, uh, there's a lot of activity where people were getting out by the Brandywine, uh, the beautiful Brandywine uh, to get away, uh, to get space and do things that were uh, safe and socially distant. And the Brandywine was a nice place to be uh, during those times in the spring. So my Muskie Mike, he showed us a fish, one of his little ones. Uh, here's a bigger one he caught. Uh, Here's, an, here's another fisherman, beautiful shad. So they're there, they're moving up, they are swimming up. So now, uh, you know, the engineering part of me, uh, we have these uh, uh, economic uh, cost estimates from a firm, uh, one of our good firms called Kleinschmidt, they're up in uh, near Lancaster, Strasburg, have given us cost estimates. What do we do? Do we build these bypasses? Maybe we pile rocks downstream to create a ramp where the fish can swim up and over. Uh, or we just take the dams out, which is what we're trying to do on dams three, four, and six. They've been breached. Uh, so we're working on that, trying to get the funding to uh, do this work in 2021. And it's kind of exciting uh, to see that. We have this criteria from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so I'll get into uh, uh, science now, uh, can't help it. But uh, you know, uh, American Shad are very strong swimmers. They can swim like eight feet per second, one of the strongest, but they can't jump. So like all the old fish ladders we used to build back in the seventies, they didn't work because they were salmon fish ladders from the West Coast and they were built for the fish to, to hop. So the American shad can't jump. Uh, it's like the movie with Woody Harrelson. Uh, American shad can't jump. Uh, uh, and so we have to build these ramps like escalators or these little stepping stones here in the channel. So very basic, we're learning more about it. So these are the type of techniques, bypass channels, so people can kayak coming down around the dams. Uh, all that work hopefully is gonna be done in 20, 2021. So again, here are the 11 dams. The first dam has been removed. The fish are swimming up to downtown Wilmington now. Uh, here's the, uh, the elevation of that, a little bit more engineering. Uh, we have the dams are here, but you can see the steep slope of the streams. And so by taking the dams out, the, fi the fish can swim on up unimpeded. Uh, we have engineering drawings. This is dam two. This shows a drawing for a fish ladder where the fish swim up. And it's very important, the, the engineers out there, that you uh, design it so that the current of the water comes down the fish ladder because the, the fish will swim toward the current. Uh, so, you know, mother nature uh, 
uh, provided these uh, these instincts uh, to the uh, to the fauna, and uh, they follow the current. So if you have the water coming down, these shad will follow the current and swim up. They do it at the uh, the first dam when the Google down at the art museum up in Philadelphia. Uh, they will follow the current and swim up if you if you can help them. So uh, this is dam three that we like to remove uh, this year. Uh, this is dam four, uh, which has a big hole in it. So we want to take that out before it. Uh, we have a dam break. Uh, here's the old fish ladder in the foreground that doesn't work. Uh, this was up at the Dupont Experimental Station, you know, where they uh, help to invent nylon uh, and all kinds of uh, very very cool experiments that the Dupont Company still does. Uh, they have a dam there that was the first Hagley Dam at the Dupont Gunpowder Mills. So it's historic. So we have to do historic. Uh, surveys and things like that. Uh, so we, we have historians out there. So it's not just about the fish. It's not just about the water quality. It's also about history. So this is one of the key ways that we can learn about Delaware history. We have historians at our Center for Historic Architecture and Design in the Biden School uh, out there uh, collecting historic data. And uh, we learned when we did a project at this on the White Clay Creek Wild and Scenic River over by the Christiana Mall, we basically rewrote about uh, 20 years of Delaware history from 1750 to 1777. We learned a lot about from that, that project about how George Washington um, had, a, uh, had a meeting with the, the Marquis de Lafayette on uh, September, um, uh, September 3rd, 7, 1777 to plan the defense of, uh, of the Brandywine. So it's really cool. Uh, this historic work, I was a history major at Rutgers for my freshman year before I switched to civil engineering. And so I, I like this, um, you know, as an avocation as well. Um, one of the things we're learning from our historians, our students doing the research is that they couldn't find the deeds in Wilmington uh, at the uh, Delaware Public Archives down in Dover, had to go to Westchester. Why to Westchester? Because Delaware used to put part of it. And the deeds are written in script. And so uh, some of our students actually have a hard time reading script because they, they aren't taught cursive writing. Uh, uh, so that's interesting. So for me, if I have to put my two cents in about elementary education, uh, or I went to Catholic school, but it's, I think it's very important to learn cursive writing, uh, particularly if you're gonna be a historian. So we missed a lot of deeds up in the courthouse because we, uh, the, the Miller, the word Miller was written and uh, we, we didn't under, quite understand uh, the writing. So uh, we have this uh, uh, hydraulic models that look at the cross sections. Here is the dams in place. If you remove them, you can estimate the velocity and depth. Uh, you wanna make sure the velocity is less than eight feet per second. So it's a very scientific process. Here's the profile again, the steep Brandywine stepping up from uh, sea level here up to dam number six, which is up near Hagley in just a few short miles. So. Uh, we, we have all the models that we, we uh, utilize. One of the reasons why we're here at the university doing this is because we have the full resource, resource of the university assisting. If we need engineering help, I can uh, ask the engineering students to help with the modeling. If we need historians, we go, I go right across the street to our Center for Historic Architecture and Design, the Biden School, uh, and they, they do that. And then we have uh, fisheries biologists down at Delaware State University that, that help us as well. So one of the things that are gonna be grow coming out of this is, this is a blue line map, National Rivers Inventory in the 1970s that National Park Service did after the 1968 National Wild Scenic River Act. The middle Brandywine is a flow through as a candidate for National Wild Scenic River status. That's something that we'd like to uh, work with the National Park Service to give it more protection. And, you know, put the Brandywine uh, back on the uh, national, international map that it deserves. Uh, the DuPonts thought so. Uh, we have some of the world's best public gardens here at 40 degrees north in a very forgiving climate. Uh, and this Brandywine Shad 2020 uh, effort is, uh, we, we think is part of that. And there's more to follow. So uh, if anybody wants to come down to Wilmington, um, we could probably introduce you to a few famous people. Um, uh, Delaware's most famous resident, for instance, is Audrey Plaza, actually. Uh, she's the Delaware. There's a very big debate about it, but uh, happy to happy to see. You. And I, I do thank you for the invitation uh, to, for this, and uh, happy to make a connection with the Athenaeum. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, Jerry. This is fascinating. Um, I, I invite 
I invite folks to type into the Q&A or chat section any questions you have, one's coming up. Um, and, and before they do, I want to say, as an historian myself, I, I really appreciate that in this process, you and, and all, all the people you're working with are taking history so seriously. And I know sometimes it can feel like, you know, no, no, no pun intended here, but an upstream battle um, to get people to care about some fish. And, and it, it seems like this is a very successful model that you are, are working on to connect it to the longer history of this place where people live um, to care about. The fish are also connected to the long-term history of, of, of who, who we've been as a people. So that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, so Scott has a question wondering if there is evidence mm. of the historic upstream limit of fish migration on the Brandywine. Yeah, that's, that's one of the great mysteries uh, because many of the mill, so the mill keeper, the mill keepers records were, are some of the best source of the data. And so since that first dam was built uh, by a Swedish surgeon in the 1680s, uh, that halted the migration, the, the spawning of the fish. So any mill keeper after that, who had mills upstream would probably not record the presence of anadromous fish. So, um, it's that's the, that's the thing is we don't have the direct historic evidence and that's for me as a curious scientist that's one of the things i'm fascinated with is how far will they swim will they swim all the way up to pennsylvania for the first uh how far will they swim uh so we know in maryland for instance on similar streams uh called deer creek near the uh the conowingo dam there uh when the dams were removed there the fish hurry uh um Hickory Shad swim about 20 miles inland on a stream very much like the Brandywine. So we've been told by the biologists they'll swim as long as it's deep enough and the velocity's there. And then they'll, then they'll, uh, they'll, they'll just keep going until they, they stop. So, but we don't know because in the first parts of uh, European settlement here, uh, the first dam was built. But to me, that's a fascinating question to be answered. Yeah. Love to find out. So, is the goal is the goal to get rid of all eleven dams? Mm -hmm. The yeah. uh, that's the goal, the direct goal, but that's that's not what will happen because many of the dams are historic. Uh, they're on the National okay. Historic Register. Uh, they're National Historic Landmarks. For instance, in Hagley, uh, there are four dams in Hagley, the very first dams that uh, the Duponts built in the 18, 19th century. Uh, so they, they won't come out. Uh, the Louis will be notched, like a, like a little notch on the side to allow the water flow through so the fish can swim through. Mm -hmm. So you have a dam and along with the water, uh, the fish swimming up or a bypass. So like at Hagley, we're looking at actually using the canals as a potential bypass. So the only dams that will be removed and the only can be partially removed are the ones that have already been breached and damaged by mother nature. And that's fascinating. They've lasted this long. They, they were pretty um, good building dams. So we're Oh, well. <laughs> that's amazing that they've lasted this long. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, they, so they Dennis. Is, yeah. So Dennis is wondering when you think we'll be able to buy shad to eat. He says he's curious about what our ancestors ate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they were eating shad. Uh, they ate shad, uh, and uh, uh, we can buy shad. So so. Uh, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, Joe, one of Joe Biden's favorite uh, grocery stores is called Jansen's right near his house in Wilmington. They sell shad and shad row uh, for people that, that, that still, still have it. And, um, you know, so um, uh, Marcus, uh, we call it Marcus Founding Fish uh, because of, um, because of uh, the, uh, the book that was written about the, uh, the shad uh, spawning out the Schuylkill. Uh, uh, and saving the troops at Valley Forge. So, um, so there's evidence there and actually there's evidence in the, uh, uh, the Hessian and the British uh, diaries that were written when they occupied Philadelphia at the time that the fish were swimming up and uh, that they were eating the, the shad. Um, so- John McPhee, thanks. Uh, I drew a blank. He <laughs> won the Pulitzer Prize and he's an amazing guy. I met him a couple of times. He's, I, heard, I don't know if he's still teaching up at Princeton, but uh, he wrote a great book about the uh, America's founding fish. Yeah. 
I see that. Uh, you and, went to school with uh, my and, sister. Did I see that? Somebody went to school. Yes, yeah, her, her her husband. Her husband went to school with your with your sister. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I, I guess we're all over the place. Small world. That's uh, Denise yeah. Fox, who works who who works at the Athenaeum. Oh hi, Denise. So bring your sister with you when you. <laughs> She's one of my biggest fans. Um, so <laughs> a sisters better be. Yeah. Um, so so Steve has a question, and then Steve's wife has a question. So okay. Steve's question is, how is the dam removal funded? And wondering if there's a comparable effort for any uh, rivers or watersheds in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there is a, there is an effort uh, going on in Schuylkill watershed, upstream of the first dam there at the Art Museum. That's a formidable dam there. Uh, but there is a, there is an effort that's going on with um, uh, with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, et cetera. Uh, there's also a good uh, effort going up on the Lehigh, uh, but those are bigger dams. Uh, so the way that to do it is to look at it as a watershed as a whole. Not just take one dam out or uh, fish passage, but doing it as a as a, as a whole. So uh, the way this is funded is it's funded through a, a combination of either a, a federal grants. So uh, for the first time, this Delaware River watershed has the Delaware Basin Conservation Act. So we have a federal appropriation through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just like they do over in the Chesapeake. And some of that that funds are utilized to restore. Uh, there's also the uh, the funds are being provided by Dupont Company. Uh, because they uh, they are interested in uh, actually uh, uh, conserving and restoring the, the the river that was was uh, where there are was the genesis of the pod company and also damage money. Uh, so when you have um, uh, uh, like the city of Wilmington, for instance, uh, there's some violations at the wastewater plant there along the Memorial Bridge. Uh, that, that damage money was paid into a fund to help remove dam number one. So a series of sources, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's interesting to see where where some of the funds are coming from, uh, from nonprofits and things like that. There's a lot of interest in this initiative, as we see from the national attention that you're you're drawing. Um, mm -hmm. Steve's wife wants to know, going back to the history and the eating shad. Um, if anyone has reviewed, if if, as, if you're aware um, from the team, if anyone's reviewed early cookbooks or diaries. For evidence of the first or early recipes for shad. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good idea, though. Um, that's something to be looked at. Right. Yeah, that could be a great, yeah. great student student project, um, mm -hmm. which can include learning and, and getting more comfortable reading script, right? Yeah. Um, hmm. Chase is wondering. Write that down. Yeah, don't forget that one. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Chase is wondering how the dam removals will affect the Delaware River and Bay. Okay. Um, so what 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 it'll, it'll happen? So since the Brandywine contributes about in the casino, about eight percent of the freshwater flow there, uh, one of the things is uh, ecologically you're you're connecting the freshwater, the Brandywine, with the uh, sometimes fresh, sometimes brackish water of the Delaware estuary. So it's been thought that you're going to connect the ecosystem together in a more seamless manner. Uh, the other, the other part is if you uh, take the dams out, uh, you're going to restore the pool and ripple sections that will reoxygenate the water. And so the thought is that perhaps the water quality will improve by uh, more oxygen. Okay, interesting. So it's it's a win all around. Um, well, the thought is there there is. Uh, and there's also symbiosis with um, the large uh, uh, osprey and, for instance, bald eagles are fish-eating species. And so they're, uh, we, we see them all the time near the brandywine uh, coming down, swooping up the fish. And so there's that symbiosis as well. Um, so Kathy says it's fascinating. I think we've got this, the two sides. We've got the history and the eating shad. Yeah. People who are fascinated on that topic, and then the people who are really interested in the dam removal, and 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 this. so it's, it's fun. So, Kathy, I'm just gonna tell you, Kathy says, fascinating that fish swam up in pre revolutionary times, and there are recipes for shad in early cookbooks. So, um, Kathy Shelton is a person to ask about that. Dan Campbell passes on to Denise Fox that Norma Milner from the Pinelands says hi to Ed, and she's 91 in Westchester. Chase lets Steve's wife know that his family's favorite Sunday morning meal was shad roan eggs. 
Um, and Richard Bartholomew says, you may not be aware that the main course for the spring quarterly meeting dinner of the Carpenters Company of Philadelphia in 1724 is still Shad and Shad Row. Wow. So we do. Mm -hmm. um, and Dennis says that the Pennsylvania Trails of History cookbook has some Shad recipes, but not sure how authentic they are. It's compiled from PA Historical Museum Commission sites. That's so crazy. we have a ton of people who are getting into this. Let's cook some shad. I think this is the pandemic cook, yeah, cooking theme coming up. People are getting tired of making their own sourdough starter, and now they want to get into shad. <laughs> nice. I, um, this is the next. I think this may be the next step of this initiative, which is uh, is cooking and uh, learning how to cook, cook the, uh, the the recipes because it's a part of culture. And this is worth the price of admission right here. I think this is great information. There we go. You know. So, so Jerry, when we're able to bring you to the Athenaeum in person, we will have a shad tasting, shad cook off or something, um, and people can bring their best shad recipes with them, and uh, you can be one of the judges. Very good. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> we'll have we can bring the shad. Uh, if we're successful, we'll have more than enough shad, and we'll we'll bring the shad. So where? Um, where do you hope to see this project in 20, say 2025? Or do you want to be on to something else different as you'll be finished it and on doing something else by then? Uh, well, there's, there is a momentum. There is a momentum that you want to capture, I think. Uh, so uh, there's a sense of urgency. Uh, we do have the momentum. Uh, sometimes you're, you're concerned about the momentum dying off and then we go on to another initiative. Uh, but uh, we're, we're trying to keep the momentum on here, especially uh, with Hunter and Hunter and Jim, Hunter, uh, you know, consistently saying we, we don't have time. Uh, the other thing is that people change, administrations change, uh, the environmental organizations have uh, changed their, their focus with elections and things like that. So we have this window of opportunity. Uh, I kid around with Hunter, I said 2020, we're, uh, you said 2020, I thought we we're gonna have the dams out. But he had a good answer. It's 2020 hindsight. Uh, <laughs> that will <laughs> we can look back now with experience. But uh, we're hoping to uh, we have a plan to uh, either provide fish passage or remove the, the six lower the next six lower dams to get us up to Hagley. And then and then Hagley will help us that when we get there. And there's there's work being done up in Chad's Ford by the Brandywine Red Clay Alliance. Uh, they're taking out a dam. Um, up near the forks of the uh, Brandywine East and West Branch near Westchester. So they're working down. So another question, um, as there's the work to bring back the shad, is there also, are there also efforts to bring the sturgeon back? So that's, that's a really, uh, really cool. Uh, uh, Dwayne Fox is a, a, a professor at the uh, Delaware State University. He's done a lot of this work. Uh, he's a great guy. He lives in Wilmington, actually. Uh, so we, we work with him all the time. Uh, his thought is that if we, we continue that, that, that the Atlantic sturgeon may come up the Brandywine and uh, you know, restore that mm -hmm. fishery as well. So they, they spawn, in, of all places, right off Marcus Hook uh, in the most urban part of Delaware because of the hard bedrock there. It's actually where the Delaware was dredged to 50 feet to accommodate the large tankers that can come through the Panama Canal now. And that's exactly the place where you don't want to uh, dredge because that's where the Atlantic sturgeon spawn and live. They're bottom, they live on the bottom. So, but they're coming back because of the, uh, protect, they, they, they're an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. So they're coming back. So we, we, we hope, and uh, I think the fishery surveys are gonna resume in the spring uh, with our Delaware Sea Grant at Hale and Division of Fish and Wildlife, they're hoping to catch um, small Atlantic uh, Atlantic sturgeon in the uh, in the lower Brandywine. So there's a question here is, and I think I'm gonna reframe it a little bit, but it, what is the, what, what would the metrics be to determine that there are enough shad return to, um, to do commercial fish, to allow commercial fishing of shad? Uh, there, there are metrics set by the, uh, uh, NIMFIS National Marine Fisheries uh, Service. They're under NOAA. Uh, and there are uh, metrics that are set based on the, the fish abundance when they then they can declare a stock uh, 
uh, large enough that it's commercially viable. Uh, so Atlantic American Shad are uh, harvested commercially in the lower Delaware, but they are protected. And they, they, the, uh, the uh, Nymphus uh, has declared the, the Delaware stock to be uh, right now not sustainable, uh, hmm. which, uh, which is a concern. But that those of us in the Brandywine like to think that, well, the Delaware may not be, but there's no reason why the Brandywine could, could be sustainable. And that would be sort of the... Uh, uh, you know, the lifesavers, uh, you know, sort of like the monasteries during the dark ages, this uh, reserve for the shad until the Delaware gets back. We have one more question. I, we have time for one more question. And um, so this is from Dennis wondering, is climate change and warming waters affecting the shad migration? Uh, along with that, are they a cold water fish or do they occur more um, in the southern and south as well? Mm. Uh, they do, they, the Atlantic the American shad will spawn from uh, the St. John's River in uh, Florida as uh, it flows mm -hmm. out of Jacksonville all the way up to, up to Maine. Uh, and they just start earlier down south and it, the, the spawning period moves north as, as you go, uh, as the season, uh, spring moves on. Uh, not quite a cold water fish, but they're very sensitive fish that requires a high dissolved oxygen uh, for propagation, in other words, living year round. They need at least like five to six parts per million of oxygen. That's more than most other fish. Uh, so they're very sensitive. And dissolved oxygen as a parameter uh, is, uh, dissolved oxygen is inversely proportional to water temperature. So we know that cool water has more dissolved oxygen because the water saturate, and dissolved oxygen saturation. So with warming waters, we are concerned that just the warming of the water uh, could offset all this restoration work that's been done, uh, and that the dissolved oxygen, which has been has been increasing, could could go down. So we are we are concerned about that, as well as uh, rising seas, which brings more salt up the Delaware Bay, uh, and with uh, rising salt, that will also decrease the dissolved oxygen. So uh, rising salt also decreases the uh, so there's this intricate chemistry uh, that that we're concerned about. Now, I'm more concerned about the lack of a snowpack coming down now. We don't get a snowpack up in Chester County. We used to have one uh, and maybe we'll get back to that because that spring freshet is very important for the rest of the year all the way after the fall. So we either seeing it very early or not at all now. So uh, uh, I'm sure whatever you want to call it, whatever its causes are, uh, we won't debate that here tonight, uh, but uh, we are concerned about the warming of the atmosphere and associated warming of the water as well. And we'll see it. We'll see it in the fisheries. I uh, hate to say this, uh, they're they're like the canaries in the coal mine. To to use another um, another saying. This is just fascinating. I mean, the number of variables that are involved from from damming of waters to the amount of oxygen, how that's affected by 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 weather and climate and amount of salt. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. And we're so grateful for the work that you're doing and that you came tonight uh, to share with us about this. I think all of us can say we have learned a lot and we've been entertained and challenged. And um, I've, I've been taking notes. So I have stuff to share with the kids over dinner about what they need to know about the American Shad. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, we're so grateful. And Tess has put up here to remind folks uh, other programs that are coming up. Um, we're almost done with the fall series uh, tomorrow night, Salute to Salute, France and Philadelphia, new book by Tree Stolen and Lynn Miller. Hope you can all join us tomorrow night. And then we'll be taking a little break and getting into January, a number of great, uh, great programs starting then also. So, um, so glad that everybody joined us tonight and look forward to seeing you again. And Jerry, we look forward to bringing you yeah. To the actual Athenaeum when 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 it's when it's uh, safe to do so. My pleasure. Looking forward to it, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Tess, as well. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening to everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. You too.